Have your Bible this morning, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, it's, uh, I preached this message about three years ago, but it kind of goes along with uh, the messages I've been preaching on uh, Christian maturity, you know, maturing as a believer. We don't have a lot of that these days. Uh, we, have, we have churches full of babies that have never grown up in the scriptures. They've never grown up and in, 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 in have some spiritual maturity. And um, I like to think that, you know, I like to think that in this church you can grow up and mature. And um, if you don't, there's going to be some regrets. And uh, the title of this message is Eternal Regrets. I don't know if you remember the message. <laughs> Hopefully you don't. But, um, or hopefully you do, maybe. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verse 52 to 58. He says there, verse 52, in a moment. That's how fast it's all going to be over with. In a moment. This all comes to an end. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Finally. <laughs> Can't wait for that change. <laughs> it says, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's those that are in the grave. They'll put on incorruption. And this mortal shall must put on immortality. That's those that are alive when the Lord comes back. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Some of us won't ever experience the sting of death, and, and, and the, uh, those that are in the grave, it'll have no victory over them. Why? Can't keep them. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. We all got the victory, okay? He's already given us the victory. Who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, in light of that, in light of that information that we've just read about being taken up and changed, whether we're alive or dead, and uh, death being swallowed up in victory, he says there, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, pray that you bless the message, Lord. I pray for a church of no regrets, at least no eternal ones. I pray, Father, for a church where uh, every member is striving to do their part to please you and to be worthy of the kingdom of God. Not that they have it, they have it, just to be worthy of it. And Father, I pray that You'd help us with these things. I pray that you'd bless those that are here this morning. Lord, I thank you for the prayer request that you've answered. And Lord, we have another whole list of prayer requests. I pray that you'd honor each one and, uh, uh, and heal some folks that need to heal, save some people that need to be saved. And just, Lord, do what you do best, and that is just change lives. And pray, Father, that you would just bless now the message. We ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Regrets. I, I've got some regrets. I've got some uh, things I regret saying, things I regret doing, things I regret not doing. I mean, I've got a few of them. I mean, probably, I don't know, about a three or four hundred of them. No, I'm not, <laughs> hopefully it's not that bad. Um, but these are temporary regrets. These are things that, you know, uh, I may have said something, hurt somebody's feelings or said something I wish I hadn't said, you know, and uh, that thing, you know, that's probably not going to be, I'm probably not going to be, be remembering that in eternity uh, due to the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I hope that's the case. I hope I don't have to remember just how sorry of an individual I am. I hope after I get that new body, the Lord wipes that new mind clean. And so the former things are no longer remembered. You know, I think there'll be some things that we'll remember, but hopefully not those things. Amen. Uh, you know, even as a saved man, I got some, I've got some regrets and some things I've said and done, wish I hadn't done, and I hope those things are gone too. Uh, but there's some, there's some other regrets that I would regret for all eternity. 
I mean, I would regret these for all eternity. And I think that if you're saved here this morning, uh, here's a list of things. Now, they're not huge, but they're a list of things. They're simple things that if you don't accomplish them, I think you're going to have an eternal regret. Uh, the first one is, you will regret having never read the Bible through at least once. I think you'll regret it. I th Listen, God wrote this book, every word of it, from beginning to end. And He wants you to read every bit of it. I mean, the verses I've got here, when Jesus Christ is on this earth, in Matthew 21, 16... And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of beads and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. In Matthew 21, 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures? The stones which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In Mark 2, 25, And he said unto them, Have ye never read? What David did when he had need and was and hungered, he and they that were with him. I mean, did you ever read it? You know, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to say something, you know, well, it's because of this. But he's going to say, have you never read? <laughs> because you probably would have known what to do had you read it. You know, this is the instruction. The Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. If you had read it, you probably would have known what to do about it. At least to pray about it. Have you never read? I think you're going to regret not having been through your Bible at least once. The preacher, he's, he's been uh, preaching on this thing ever since he came in the church. He's been preaching on that. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. If you don't get a chapter, then read half a chapter. If you don't, can't read a half a chapter, read a verse. Read your Bible every day. You know, when he was preaching that, I wasn't doing it every day. I'm doing it every day. And, and, and if I fail on a day, I pick it right back up. Doesn't matter how many times I fail. The following day, I'm going to pick up the Bible and read it. That's how you keep going at it. What I know for sure is this. I will have read more Bible, even if I failed half the time, than if I hadn't read it at all. And I've been through it a few times. Shamefully, not as many times as I should have been through it. But I know this, if you haven't been through it at least once, I think you'll be ashamed, and I think you'll have a regret. God wrote this thing for you, man. I mean, it's here. He preserved it. It's in front of you. And it's the most important words you will ever read. So I think you need to read it. I don't want to get to heaven. And he says to me, have you never read? And I, I have to say, no, I didn't read it. No, no. I may have read it, forgot it, <laughs> but I read it. So you know how this works. Get through your Bible. You say, well, I can't get through it a year. Then get through it in two years. Well, I can't get through it in two years. Then get through it in three years. But get through it. Read it. I'm not talking about what you study. I'm talking about just what you read. There's other parts of it you need to study. So I think you'll have, uh, you will regret having never read the Bible through at least once. The second thing I think you'll regret is you will regret never having won a soul to Christ. I think you'll regret that. Now, you can be responsible for somebody getting saved and never actually be the one lead them to it because there's one that watereth and one that soweth and the Bible says they're the same. You understand that? It's God that gives the increase. Okay, when, I, when it says he that winneth souls is wise, it's God that does the saving, okay? But you're the one that wants to win them. That's why you pass out the tracts. That's why you tell people about the Lord. That's why you go to the rest home. That's why you go to the prison. That's why you, you bring people to church. Because you want people to know. And if you've been doing that, you, you said, well, I've never actually prayed with someone. Well, it, it's a thrill. Do it. You know, do it. <laughs> it's fun. I mean, it's, it's enjoyable to see people getting saved. 
But even if you haven't ever done that, doesn't mean you're not responsible for somebody being saved. Sometimes they don't, you know, you, you, listen, I have no idea how many people I've talked to that somebody else down the road want them. But they want them because some, something I did or I sowed some seed or I watered some seed. And the same is with you. The thing is, you stay at it. Don't worry about the results. Just do it. And the Lord will give you fruit. But I think you regret it. He said in um, 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I looked at that verse before that because I thought, well, maybe that's just talking about ministers, but it's talking about uh, uh, every man. Um, well, let me turn over there. 2 Corinthians 5. Yep. That's the verse. 517. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I think that's ministers. I, I think that's uh, everybody, isn't it? Anybody that's saved, right? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Not me, not just me. You know, not the trustee of the deacon in the church, but, you know, but all of us. He's given that ministry to. We're to reconcile people to Jesus Christ. As long as you've got breath, as long as you've got the ability to tell someone, you ought to be telling somebody. In a moment. And there I am looking. I'm, I'm looking in the eyes that are as a flame of fire. I'm looking dead in his eyes. He's looking at mine. I don't know how soon that judgment's going to commence. Probably pretty quick. But if you can imagine just standing before your Lord and you don't have not one soul that you were partly responsible for, for, for being saved. Not one. I feel, I feel pretty worthless at that point. I think I'd have this eternal regret. You know, there's, there, I think there has to be a reason at that point. I've been saved long enough. I know sometimes I'm just lazy. Okay, that, that could be a reason. Uh, scared can be another reason. Fearful. That could be another reason. Or you just don't care. <laughs> None of them are right. None of them are a good excuse. Um... You know, some of the fiercest people that I thought I'd have trouble with were the easiest ones to win. And some of the most docile people turned out to be the most vicious. <laughs> you never know. The thing is, you just open your mouth and you tell folks. You, you, we talked about learning those verses in, in, in the Bible. We've gone over now how many times in this church about how to win someone to Christ and uh, all the verses that you need and how to explain the verses and memorize the verses so that if you don't have your Bible, you can still tell them the verses. You're either going to do that or you're not going to. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to be you. I just wouldn't want to be you facing your Lord and having never opened your mouth for him. I think that'd be an eternal regret. You regret having never become a faithful member of a sound local church. I believe that. Um, and and I'm, not one of these, I'm not one of these fellows that makes the local church the idol. I believe the Lord gets first billing in everything. But the Lord did establish the local church. I mean, He's the one that ordained it. He chose it that He was going to use this to do the labor and that's exactly, that's exactly what he's done. You hear excuse after excuse, you know. I can't find a good church because all the hypocrites. And our, we just say, come on in, we got room for another. <laughs> um, you know, the, you know I, I like what was said about that a, a, a church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. I believe that. Uh, we all come in here, we all have... We all have our own set of problems. We all have different personalities. Um, but you know what? The binding, this word, we get along. 
We get along because of this book. One mind because of this book. This is the common denominator. There's probably some of you wouldn't hang around me. If you knew me outside of here, you wouldn't want to hang around me. And I might not want to hang around you. But because we both believe in this book and we believe the, the God of this book, I can fellowship with anybody on them grounds. That's that common denominator. But you know what? I can't even imagine where I'd be without the local church. I can't even imagine it. I can't imagine where my family might be. Even if I'd have a family. I just realize how important that thing is. You realize over, you're sitting here and, and you're listening to somebody yell at you, you know, and stomp and scream and everything. But you know it has an effect on you over time. It has an effect on your children over time. I mean, you just about have to be in a coma here not to have something enter that noggin of yours. And I know some of you are in a coma here half the time on Sunday morning. Amen. <laughs> Eyes rolling in the back of your head. and I know how tough it is. But even then, most, I mean, you know, some of the time you're awake, you're going to get, you're going to get something. You're going to get something, you know. We quote enough scripture around here, probably 10 times as much in most Baptist churches. It's, you know, take a verse and take a fit. Well, I'm not that kind of preacher. I take a hundred verses and take a fit. I just, I like scripture. In fact, I'm going to read you a bunch of them right here. Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord on whom they believed. Acts 14, 27. When they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. They did that before the church. Not for the, you know, um, promise keepers. You say, well, don't they do good things? I don't care if they do do good things. God ordained the local church. And some parachurch organization does not fit the bill. What usually happens is you have groups like that that draw everybody and his brother and they end up compromising God out of it. That's not the point. We never compromise God out of it. You ought to see how Jesus Christ reacts to people that want him to compromise. I mean, read it. He never compromised not one word of that book. And if that sent you to hell, there you go. We're not going to compromise. I'm not saying we're going to beat him over the head like a, you know, like a ball bat either. But we don't compromise the book, ever. Why? This represents God to us. I'm not compromising him out for anybody, for any reason. If I did that, I sell him out, then what's the point? So you can get along with him? That's your problem, you'll get along with him. So I don't agree with him. That's your problem, because I agree with him 100%. Uh, one day you'll agree with him. Whether you <laughs> like it. You know, I, I love how people like, well, if he's that kind of God. I'm like, it doesn't matter what kind of God he is. He's still God. Do you understand that? Do you understand? You're, you're the ant and he is God? Do you not understand that? He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't. He cares what he thinks. You're to think like him. Let this mind be in you. He wants you to get rid of your mind. Everybody wants to be God. Everybody. And that's why they create God in their own image. I'm talking to people and I'm thinking, you're describing yourself, man. You're describing you. That's who they want to be God. They want themselves. And if he's not like me, I don't want him. He's not like you. Thank God he's not like you and he's not like me. Thank God he's not. You say, what is it? You're wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, my buckler, my shield, my friend. He, he's everything to me. He's everything. He's my God. He's my creator. Why would I sell him out to get you to accept him? Well, you show me that. You show me where Jesus Christ ever sold him out. Anybody ever sold him out <laughs> for that reason. 
uh, I don't know where I left off, Acts 15, 4, and, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Acts 15, 22, then pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church. You see, time and time again, we're talking about the church in the book of Acts. Why? That's what God chose. The work that we do, the ministries that we uh, uh, participate in, he chose it through a local church. So how can uh, a child of God say, I don't go to church? Or I don't like church? Are you, are you, are you crazy? That's how it started. The work. He said, where two or, two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Thank God we got more than two or three. Happy to have a bunch here. But God's going to use the local church to, for the work and to perform the things he wants done because that's the vehicle he chose. Okay? And anything else is just outside of Scripture. And when you get outside of Scripture, you're on shaky ground. And I'm not... I'm not saying that parachurch organizations don't do some good. But if it's not scripturally based, it will come to naught. If it's not scripturally based, then there is something wrong with it. Why would you go join a, join a parachurch organization when you can join a church? I think it's because they just don't, they don't, there's some folks, no matter what, they just don't want to do it God's way. <laughs> they want to do it my way. Who, who's the, I did it my way. Who is that? <laughs> Frank Sinatra, there you go. Well, you know where he wound up. He did it his way. You got to do it the Lord's way. Look, he gave you the book. You know what I see? Church, 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 church. Find a good Bible-believing church, get in and get to work. You regret not giving a sacrificial portion of your wealth back to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 9 says, But this I say, this is Paul, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Law of reaping and sowing. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. God cares about the attitude. This is not the Old Testament tithe. Oh, I call it a tithe, but it's not the Old Testament tithe. The Old Testament tithe, you did it or else. You go over and read it, Malachi. If you didn't give it, you're robbing him. Malachi chapter 3. But here it just says that you're sowing sparingly. So don't, don't expect a lot, okay? It says, but so let him give, not grudgingly. Okay, take it. Or of necessity. We've never put, we, I have never put that criteria on being a member of this church, ever. But I'll encourage you to give. How often do I preach on giving? Almost never. There's a box at the rear of the church. We don't even take up an offering here. But I'll encourage you as a Christian, as a member of this church, to give. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Said he loveth. I'm thinking, I'm thinking you know, if you gave cheerfully, and you gave bountifully, and you gave sacrificially, and he's, he's looking at you, he's not got this grimace on his face or this frown. Or, the, or his brows knit together looking at you. But he's, he's smiling at you. Because God loveth a cheerful giver. It says, now hold on now. Here's one of the greatest promises in the Bible to a giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Man, that's a promise. All sufficiency in all things that you can abound. That means it, the thing goes. <laughs> As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor. What? His righteousness remaineth forever. Hmm. Never thought about my giving as righteousness. 
But you know what? When you give, you're usually supporting a church that's out winning souls or missions that's out winning souls, and they remain forever, those people we win. Kind of interesting. Philippians chapter 4, here's another promise. Paul said, But I have all and abound, and I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He talked about these folks that they gave out of their poverty. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I believe that. I'd rather have God supplying my need than you. Because God will do a lot better job. So two of the greatest promises of the Bible are based on the believer's giving. I believe there'll be some regret. There's a lot about giving in the Bible. There's so much about giving. There's, there's more than that than there is about soul winning. Because it's all about, for God so loved the world, He gave. It is about giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So if you're going to be a spiritual Christian, you're going to have to give. And you're going to have to learn to give. And you're going to have to learn to give cheerfully. Hmm? Yep. Reap what you sow. I think there'll be some regrets there. And there's a lot of Christians that are going to be regretful. There's going to be a lot of them. Uh, leave it at that. Next one. You will regret having never found a place of service in God's vineyard. He said in Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 to 31, What think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. A lot of preachers have that testimony. <laughs> Where God says, go in the vineyard. They go, no, no, they're scared to death. And then later on, the Lord gets hold of the heart, and they repent, and they go anyway. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Hmm. Whither them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, The first Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And it's interesting that, you know, when he says publicans and harlots, think about uh, Rahab the harlot. She got in, man. She got in. The thing here is, God's got a place for you in the vineyard. He's got a place for you to go to work. He says, Go work in my vineyard today. Some say, I'm going, and they never go. And some say, oh, I'm not going, and they end up going. As long as you go. As long as you go. You go and work in that vineyard. They say about 10% of the church does 90% of the work. That's not true in this church, though. Thank God for that. But in typical churches, 10% of the church does 90% of the work. About 20% of the church gives everything that the church has. And the missions and everything. See, there's not a lot of people, there's not a lot of Christians that are doing this. You say, what? Eternal regrets, man. They're going to regret it. He goes, so why didn't you go to work in my vineyard? Why didn't you do what you could? You could have been a part of this. You could have been a part of that. You could have done this. You could have done that. You will uh, you'll regret never having loved God first and put God first in your life. Now, I got a hold of this thing, man. I mean, it tore me up. When I understood the relationship that I should have with God, and I don't think most Christians have, an, have any idea, they think if they love their neighbor, that that fulfills the relationship. Well, that's the second great or That's the second commandment. Or the second great commandment. The one, the first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And then... Love thy neighbor as thyself. A lot of Christians got that down. There's, there's, you say, what? They're on the level with a communist or a socialist. They got it down, man. They love their neighbor. But what about God? God is not your neighbor. He's just not. He's God. Do you love him? The Bible says that, he, that Jesus Christ might have the preeminence in all things. You know that passage over there that um, 
it says that except, and, and so two different, there's two different things in that thing. There's one that says, except you hate your father and mother and <laughs> your wife and kids. He says, you're not, he says, you're not worthy of me. Or he says, he that loveth father or mother uh, more than me is not worthy of me. You ever read that passage of scripture? It goes on to talk about sisters and brothers and all that. I thought, first he says, if you love them more, you're not worthy of them. Then it says, unless you hate them, you're not worthy of him. I'm like, what in the world? Hate them? I thought we're supposed to love everybody. But then I got to thinking about the gap, the difference. And the Lord kind of gave me an illustration about that thing. It's like, uh, and, and for some people this don't work. Um, you'll understand in a minute. Uh, it's like you got your child and a dog. Okay? Both run out into the middle of the road. And you're going to run out and save one of them. And there's not even going to be a scintilla of uh, debate in your mind which one it's going to be. Now, if you say the dog, and there are probably some of them at will today. You, know. you say, what's the, the difference between your love for a child and your love for the pet is the difference between love and hate. That's how vast it is. I mean, you'll walk away from the one for the other. And see, God wants that difference too. You see, everybody's down here on this level. God's here. The difference between love and hate. Now, that's what he wants. Man, when I figured that thing out, I'm like, I got a ways to go, Lord. I got a ways to go. Now I'm getting there. You say, how did that? Just stay in that book. Talk to him. Learn about him. The more I learn about him, the more I love him. And that thing starts to build. And when the day comes for that decision, and there'll, be no, there'll be no debate in your mind. Listen, the fact that you have that debate going on in your mind tells you that there's not that difference. You'll never regret that, by the way. He's the creator. He is God. You're not going to regret that. I think some people think, well, that's, I don't know if I like that. Why wouldn't you? Without Him, what do you have? The love that you have in your life is because of Him. Why wouldn't you love Him more? Why wouldn't you love Him above everything? Your kids, your wife, your, 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 your family, your, your job, your stuff. Why wouldn't you love him supremely above all the... He's the one that provided all of it. It doesn't make any sense when you think about it. And yet folks will put everything in front of God. And I mean everything. He's not first on the list. He's last. But I'll tell you this. He won't even take second place. So don't put him there. It's unacceptable to God. It's first or nothing. That's the way it is. And last of all, this is just a point to clarify that all these regrets will be real to you in a moment. In a moment. Come up hither! And then all you can think is, oh my God, I hope I did everything I should have done. Oh, I wish I'd done more of this. I wish I'd done more of that. All you'd be talking about is what you wish you would have done and you can't come back and do it. Another thing that God kind of revealed to me is the difficulties, the things that God, uh, the things that are in our way, um, just every little thing you can think of, every little bump in the road, every little uh, distraction, uh, every little variable, circumstances, pain, anxiety, are you too busy? It's all, and the Lord said, you're never going to have that again. I'm like, what? I said, he says, you're never going to have that again. You're never going to be able to serve me under these conditions again, ever. Because you'll never feel pain again. 
You'll never feel anxiety again. You'll never uh, not feel like serving me. Only now do you get that opportunity to do this. When you got a headache, when things ain't going right, when you got a terrible disposition, when you're in a bad mood, you can still serve him now. Once that trumpet blows, in a moment, never again, those circumstances. Never again. You say, what is that? The sincerity of your love. He will prove the sincerity of your love because if you love him, no matter how you feel, you'll do it. That's what love does. So why I have that opportunity, why I have these conditions, and I believe God creates the conditions. He wants to know what you'll do. We got a whole country full of Christians that think that faith is a feeling, and it's not. It's what you believe. If you believe it, you'll do it. You don't have to feel it. It's still so, whether you feel it or not. Second Corinthians 5, 8 to 11, and I'll, I'll finish. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. You know, the Bible talks about that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Dr. Ruckman used to explain it that there could be something you're doing that's good, but it's not acceptable. In other words, you're, you're, you're doing something, but it's not, it's not where God wants you to be and how God wants you to be doing it. Then there's an acceptable will of God where you're where God wants you to be and you're doing what God wants you to do, but you may not be doing it exactly the way God wants you to do it. And then there's the perfect will of God where you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, where He wants you to do it, the way He wants you to do it. That's the perfect will of God. God does not have to accept. He accepts your person, but He does not have to accept your labor. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in His body, whether that it... Uh, According to he had, excuse me, according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. And then the next verse, just knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Oh, what is that? What, what is that? I thought, you know, lost people, they'll feel terror. No, he's talking to the Christian, knowing their judgment seat of Christ, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I'm face to face with him. And what? What is it? Regrets. And the only thing I can tell them, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to say that too many times. And I hope you don't either. <clears throat> the Bible describes him as one, as a lamb slain. So while he's looking at you with eyes as a flame of fire, he bears the mark of that crucifixion. That makes the regrets even worse. You realize how much he gave he gave all. And then you realize what you gave. We have an opportunity. This is Laodicea. It's a great time to be a Christian, and it's a bad time to be a Christian. <laughs> when I say that, I mean it's always good to be saved, but it's, it's not the best time to be living at. We don't have them revived around the world. That does not mean that we're to stop laboring. That does not mean we're to quit. That does not mean we're not to give the Lord our best every day. 
He mentioned over there where the, he was talking to the folks that were going into the vineyard. And he said, uh, he told them to line up. He said, from the last unto the first. I don't know if you know what that means. That means Laodicea goes first. We're up first for the judgment. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. We're up first. And then, if you labored, whether it was the heat of the day, there was persecution, or there was a, a hard labor, that's not what he asked. He said, did you labor? And if they labored, they got a penny. They got a wage. They got a reward. If they didn't, they didn't. And somebody could say, well, them Laodiceans, they never, they never shed their blood. They never had to be worried about somebody killing them. He said, did you not agree? When you got saved, you agreed to what the Lord wanted. <laughs> Listen, you go to work in my vineyard, I'm going to pay you. I'm, all I'm saying is this. We don't have to bring home the world. We don't have to win the United States of America to get a reward from God. We just have to labor the way that book tells us to labor. And if we labor, he'll reward us. Whether it's in the heat of the day or not, whether it's the last hour of the day or not. He said, did you not agree? I, I appreciate that. I mean, are we going to compare our work to what, to what um, Billy Sunday did? Are we Are going to compare our work to what uh, John Wesley did? Or how about D.L. Moody? Dwight L. Moody, man, the man won a quarter of a million people to Jesus Christ. That's not the issue. God giveth the increase. Is did you labor? Did you serve him? No regrets. I want to get to heaven and have as few regrets as possible. None if I can, if I can, if I can work it that way having done all that I can for him. And that is just an understanding that you have this opportunity to serve your God now. He knows you have your families. He knows you have your jobs. He knows you have to make a living. He knows all that. He also knows that you have time to serve him. He also he knows that you have, you have money to give him. You have sacrifices to make for him. He knows that you can put him first if you want to. Most Christians never really get to know the God of this book. I encourage you to get to know Him. Talk to Him. Read it. Find out who He is that you're dealing with every day. He will astound you. On every level that I can possibly talk to you, He will astound you. He will amaze you. He truly is. The, 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 listen, all the things it says are true. He is wonderful. And he's worthy. He's worthy of everything that you'll do for him. Let's all stand. With every head bowed, <clears throat> if you're here this morning, we want to give you a time of invitation. If you'd like to come forward.